All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our virtual event space. So my name is Ali, and I'll be your host this afternoon. And I am so excited to be introducing Allison Cochran and Rachel and Solomon here to discuss Allison's new book, The Charm Offensive. But before we get into the good stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in. As much as we miss having you all in the bookstore, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and buying books. Your support really is what makes all of this possible. So I will be linking books directly in the chat all evening. So it'll be super easy to go find them. For all of you in the Seattle area, come on in. All three of our locations are open or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local, we do ship. And once again, we are so, so grateful for your support. While you are over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up over the next few months. And if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs. And of course, you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. Speaking of social media, if you'd like to check out some of our past virtual events, you can find all of our virtual events on our YouTube channel, including this event within the next 48 hours. So if you'd like to see any of our virtual events or share this one, go ahead and track us down over there. We are third place books. Um, and okay, so we're here for an hour. Towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. We would love to know where you are from or your favorite latest read. But when it comes time for questions, do make sure that those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. So before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone of our commitment to ensuring the safety and well-being of event attendees and guest authors. So in our chat and question spaces, please do lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. Uh, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of the screen. Select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. And finally, should any technical issues arise, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them, and we very much appreciate your patience and understanding. All right, and with that, I believe that is my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce Allison Cochran, whose debut novel, The Charm Offensive, came out just a week ago. Uh, it was named a most anticipated rom-com by BuzzFeed, LGBTQ Reads, Bustle, The Nerd Daily, Entertainment Tonight, Frolic Media, and more. And our resident romance expert, Danielle, said it was in the running for her favorite book of the year, which is very high praise from Danielle. Um, in it, Dev, the producer of a long-running reality dating show, struggles to craft the perfect love story for anxious, awkward, and disgraced Charlie, who has no idea how to date 20 women on camera, especially since Dev and Charlie have far better chemistry than any of the women Charlie is supposed to be dating. So in conversation this afternoon, I am so pleased to introduce Rachel Lynn Solomon, the author of The X Talk, You'll Miss Me When I'm Gone, our year of maybe, today, tonight, tomorrow, we can't keep meaning like this, and the upcoming Weather Girl, which is about a TV meteorologist and a sports reporter who scheme to reunite their divorced bosses with unexpected results. So thank you all so much for being here. I can see you all sounding off in the chat. Welcome, welcome. Oh my gosh, from so far. Um, so if anybody needs anything, go ahead and give me a shout. Um, I will be in the chat and I will be listening. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. Welcome, both of you. Hi, thank you so much, Allie, for that great introduction. I am so excited to be here with Allison talking about The Charm Offensive, which is also one of my favorite books of the year. Um, and so excited to, to see everyone here. Um, I mean, my love affair with this book dates back to uh, earlier this year when I 
um, begged to read it in your DMs and then proceeded to just squeal about how much I loved it. And um, even today, honestly, like before this event, I was rereading some of my favorite passages um, <laughs> because it's just, it's just so great. And I'm not, I, I'm not someone who tends to reread, but this one is absolutely one that you can go back to again and again, because it's just so, just so comforting. Um, so just to kick things off, I would love to know what inspired this book. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, and I think you even said this maybe in your in your blurb, but I am also a, a long suffering fan of the Bachelor franchise. Um, so I've been watching that show for for quite some time, um, and that definitely was a big part of the inspiration for this book. Um, and in fact, kind of trying to figure out like under what circumstances might might someone like me um, go on a show like The Bachelor, and, and kind of Charlie as a character came out of that. Um, but I think also like. In a lot of ways, this book was inspired by the fact that I've just always been obsessed with romance. Um, like my whole life, like little Allison just loved love stories. And of course, as like a kid, that was mostly Disney movies and then like lots of YA fantasy and my adolescent years. Um, and I've just always been a really huge fan of consuming um, romance in its many forms. But I think, um, you know, as Growing up in the 90s and the, the early aughts, there were not any stories uh, featuring queer people in the, like, the, the love stories I was consuming. And so the kind of heteronormativity of the media that I, I consumed definitely made it harder in my life for me to figure out um, that I'm gay. And, and so I think in a lot of ways, this book was inspired by kind of the questions of how representation impacts our ability um, to kind of see ourselves in um, especially when it comes to happy endings. And so that was a big part of my inspiration as well. Um, that's, I mean, I love that so much. And this book just feels like, I wish you could hand it to the Bachelor producers and be like, here's what to do right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, it was like both of us said, I mean, in my blurb and like you just said, as a long-suffering Bachelor fan, you really get to know the tropes of the show and the um, kind of go-to um, phrases that people constantly use and just the, uh, the way it all works and, you know, the far-off locations and um, the dates and everything. Um, and reading this book really feels like watching a season of The Bachelor. Um, and down to all just the specifics of all the locations that you take us. Um, what was the research process like? Uh, well, when I did the first draft of the book, I didn't do any like bachelor related or like reality television research. I just kind of went off of like being along watch, like watching a lot of reality TV, kind of what I know about tropes and how they work. Um, and then I went back, you know, in the revision process and I read like every article I could find from like you know, Bachelor alums kind of like sounding off and spilling the tea about behind the scenes stuff. Uh, they all have podcasts. So there's just like a, a real they wealth do. of information <laughs> out there that you can find. Um, towards the end of my revision process, I definitely spent time watching YouTube videos on like training someone to do the, the editing for a reality television show just so I could like figure out how to do the like interstitials with the, the scripts. Um, but in terms of travel specifically, like I just picked places that I'd been to that I love. And so that part was really easy. <laughs> um, I know, I feel like this book just seems like it was so fun to write, getting to do that research. Yeah, and it was super fun. <laughs> there is such a like bachelor to podcast pipeline at this point. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. Every single one of them has a podcast for sure. Um, bachelor to, to podcast, then bachelor to, uh, you know, fab fit fun boxes and, <laughs> and the like on Instagram. Um, and so the two main characters, you have, uh, Charlie, who is the, the bachelor essentially. Um, and then Dev, who is his producer and both of them just feel so real to me. And I can already tell, um, just from things you've said before, and even just in this conversation, like you've poured so much of yourself into both of them. Um, and this book is dual POV. So I'm really curious, given that both of them have all these pieces of you in them, which one was more difficult to write or were they equally hard, equally easy? Um, 
Charlie was both harder to write and easier to write. He was harder to write in the beginning because I kind of, he's, he's much more of me. Um, and so I, by the end, put a lot of myself into him as a character. But in the beginning, I was kind of like holding him at a distance. I kind of was like, well, no, I don't want to make it too much like myself. Um, and so in the beginning, he was, he was challenging because it was just hard for me to like let go and be like, all right, let's just put all the messy stuff in there. Like, let's just make him, let's make him as real as possible. Um, and once I kind of decided that, he came much easier as a character to, to write. I mean, that's just one thing that I am continually admiring hearing you talk about this book because you have just been so open about everything in a way that I know is really difficult for people even who've been doing this for like years and years and years so just coming to it with a book that is this personal and like inviting people into your <laughs> into your space in this way like I just as an author and like as a human have so much respect for that um thank you oh, yeah, yeah I worked on it with my therapist a lot so like <laughs> it was like you know a year and a half ago being like all right people are going to read this book like help me figure out how how to deal with that because that's an intense level of vulnerability Yes, and that, I mean, that actually kind of segues into the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is that you have been so open about your own mental health journey, and mental health is a really huge element of this book. Um, and what I think is so interesting about mental health in particular is it's often really hard to tell, even from a blurb, whether that's a really big part of the book. Um, and here, you know, I really saw a lot of myself in Charlie's OCD, and Dev's journey also really resonated with me. Um, and I think it is just so important in books with mental health representation that a romance doesn't heal the character's depression or whatever they're they're struggling with. Um, and this is like the most perfect example of that that I've ever read because you do such a phenomenal job. Um, could you talk more about this? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that I'm glad that by the end it it doesn't feel that way. You know, that the product I put out in the world doesn't send that message that a love story can heal you, uh, because I think that was really challenging, because by their very nature, right, romant romantic comedies and romance novels have to have a happily ever after, right? Like, that is how it goes. You know they're going to end up together in the end, and I think it's really easy to also kind of wrap up all of the conflicts within the story, and of course, like, most of them have to be wrapped up, but for things like depression, um, you know, that's not like, I went to three therapy sessions, and now it's fixed, <laughs> um, you know, and so I tried really hard uh, to convey this idea that that's, that's a lifelong experience, that's probably a lifetime of work, uh, and I, I hope that when you read the end, it also conveys the idea that just because you're still doing that work doesn't mean you aren't ready for a relationship. Like, we all have, have that work to do, you know, in different ways, whatever our health may be, and so I think um, hopefully that comes across by the end. It really does. And like so, so beautifully too. And it just felt very real. And I think there is so much to be said for romantic comedies, especially because I think readers go in maybe expecting something light and fluffy. Like I have been tagged in so many things over the past couple of years now that I'm writing more of romantic comedies that have say things like, oh, I wasn't expecting this book to have substance. Um, yeah. <laughs> some of them are said that way. Some of them are said like a little more nicely. Um, but I really just love the idea of like a realistic romantic comedy where like people don't always look airbrushed and perfect and like people's brains aren't always, you know, operating perfect or perfectly or whatever, you know, the societal expectation of that is. And this book, um, I didn't expect the, the mental health would be such a huge part of it going in, but like, I'm so glad it was and it just made it come to life all the more. Yeah, thank you. I know I always kind of get scared because I, I didn't really think like, don't write a, don't write a romantic comedy about depression. Um, don't write a romantic comedy about <laughs> mental illness because it just like felt like how the story needed to be told. And sometimes I'm like, oh gosh, I hope people are okay with that. Um, it's okay to laugh too. Right. Well, I mean, I, I think that there are so many similar threads in this and Weather Girl because like for the longest time in my phone, I just had a note that said romantic comedy about depression. And that like eventually evolved into that book. And I just, yeah, there really, I think there really is so much to be said about like romantic comedies that don't tie up everything perfectly. Like you can give the characters a happily ever after or a happy for now, but like they are still working on themselves. And like, that's, 
a lifelong process. And I love that about Weather Girl. Just like as a side note, oh, Weather thank Girl's you. Thank you. depiction of yeah Ari's journey with depression and the work that she's doing was whew, so relatable. And I loved it. Oh, thank you. I, I like the idea of the two of them being friends. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Um, and so another interesting thing about this book, and this is probably like my author brain that I can never fully turn off, but it is written in third person present which I think is one of the hardest, I think it's the hardest tense to get right. Um, at least definitely for me, I'm really intimidated by it. <laughs> um, but you absolutely nail it. And, you know, all the characters' emotions are so vivid and so immediate on the page. Um, so I would love to know how you decided what tense to write the book in, if it just naturally came out this way. Because um, third person present is like, one of the rarer tenses to see. Yeah, I've always written in past tense, um, like my whole life, you know, I've been writing like since I was we, and I always wrote everything in past tense. And then I just, for some reason, sat down and started writing this one in present. And I feel like it unlocked something um, that just like made the writing come easier in a way that I did not expect. And so uh, my next book is also in in present tense, it's in first person present, and I'm kind of scared people are going to, to hate that. But um, I I sort of like present tense. I find that it, um, I don't know, I find that it is liberating in a lot of ways um, because you can just write about that, the immediacy of the emotions and you don't have to filter it. You can just be like in the head of the character um, as they're experiencing things. Yeah, you know, I, it's funny because I, once I started writing in first person present, which is what all my books have been in, I like never looked back, but the more romance I read in third person, like when someone has a handle on third person, it just really like, you are just so engrossed. Like, I, I mean, your book, it does this beautifully, um, you know, Casey McQuiston's books are amazing, um, Rosie Dannon's books, I third third person is like We're such awesome. a joy to read yeah um and yeah the more and more I'm just like could I maybe one day <laughs> I'm really loving first person right now I like don't know if I even want to go back to like I oh, find well, it's it, probably freeing <laughs> yeah I'm having a lot of joy with it I'm really really loving it and so yeah I'm like the the contrast between the two is feels really jarring to me but I'm really excited about first person well I'm very excited to read that and we will talk more about that um, toward the end. Um, but speaking of just the writing process, um, are there any scenes from earlier drafts that didn't make it into this final version? Oh my gosh, literally hundreds. I am <laughs> the sloppiest reviser. Um, I write scenes that, and then like immediately delete them the next day. I, I like have rewritten so many of these scenes just hundreds of times. So yes, um, there would be you know, lots of deleted scenes in the director's cut. One scene that I often think about and wish that I could add back in, um, even though it wasn't super crucial to the plot, but when they go to Cape Town, like originally I had a scene um, where they went to Robben Island, um, which is where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned during apartheid. And like, um, I have obviously Cape Town is one of my favorite places that I have ever visited. Um, and that as a location is like incredibly affecting. And so I really wanted to have that scene. And of course, like I tried to make it work thematically with the book um, and it didn't, it didn't quite work. Um, and so I ended up cutting that scene, but that's a scene that I, I would love to add back in. Maybe, maybe bonus material later. Yeah, exactly. The really like cheerful scene um, about Robin Island. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I find it so interesting to hear about other people's processes because I actually, I don't know if you do this, but I keep a draft or a, a file of everything that I cut from a book just in case so I go back to it later. And usually yeah. that's like 30,000 words by the end. <laughs> yeah, I keep it in like a thousand different places. Keeping a single file sounds very, very smart. Um, I usually just have it like scattered all over. It'll be like bits and bops, things you cut. And like, I have to go hunt for things all the time. I'm just imagining you working on like several books from now and you have a file that's just like bits and bops seven. Oh yeah. It's, or, I always <laughs> just date them. That's how I like distinguish. So I can just name things the same way. I'll just put a date on the front. That counts. Um, my chaotic process is that every time I work on my book, I save it with a different number. 
Mm, yeah. um, so I can see like what the previous revision looked like. I mean, just just before um, I dialed into this, I saved something as like 114. <laughs> so that's oh my gosh. I do it like multiple times a day. It's really bad. And I wish that I could is, stop. <laughs> I'm honestly fascinated by that strategy. I love that. Yeah, it's, I mean, everyone has their own brand of chaos that works for them. And it's all chaos, right? Like yeah. it has to all be sloppy. <laughs> if someone has like an organized way of doing it, I would love to hear about it. But mine is uh, is absolutely bonkers. Yes, uh, I, I, they, they definitely all are in, in their own special ways. Um, and just a reminder that if anyone has questions, you can put them down there in the Q&A box or wherever it is on your screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, questions for Allison. Uh, this was actually a question that I only thought of with the book just staring right at me from, from my desk, um, the title. So I actually had never heard the phrase charm offensive until last year. <laughs> and I think it might've been when your book was announced. Um, and I totally, I think I totally thought it was just a jumble of words that like you made yeah. up. Um, but it's actually a real phrase that means something. Yes. Um, so I would love it if you could explain that and then also explain how you arrived at the title. Um, yeah, so a charm offensive is just like a campaign of flattery to like get somebody to do like what you want or to like get them on your side. Um, right. And of course, like Dave is the main character is like incredibly charming and he's trying to like charm Charlie to like be the star that he needs to be. And I think like Maureen uses the phrase at some point in the book. Um, but I actually, the, the story of how I arrived at the title is rather ridiculous. So after I wrote, I wrote a first draft of this book and then I just had so much fun writing it. It was just like, honestly, a, a delight. Um, and so I was like, let's keep the good times rolling. And I wrote two more books kind of set in the same reality television universe. Um, and the titles of those two books had the word charm in them. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, like I have this untitled first book um, in order for it to be a series, like I have to find a way to work the word charm into the title. And so I think I literally Googled like phrases with the word charm um, and the charm of, and charm offensive came up and I was like, oh yeah, actually that works perfectly. I love it. And then I just like slapped that on there. Oh um, my God. That's so funny. Well, I mean, first of all, who do we have to bribe at Simon and Schuster to get those, <laughs> those other yes. two books? Right now they so just any on my computer. <laughs> Um, okay. I mean, if you have, um, like a spare set of keys, do you keep it like under <laughs> your, your doormat? <laughs> They're also unreadable as of right now, but yes. Um, I, I mean, I love that so much because I think it, you do such an amazing job fleshing out the side characters that it is impossible to get to the end of this book and like not want more, um, which is great. I mean, I think that famous saying, right? Like always leave them wanting more. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, very obvious, but uh, no, I mean, I think that that's, you want someone to get to the end and feel like, ah, I need it. Um, so how do you write such compelling side characters? Because some of them are real scene stealers. Um, honestly, it takes me until the very last draft, I think, to get to that point with side characters. I find it and because I am writing right now, I'm revising my second book and my side characters, so many of them feel really one dimensional and they are, they're falling flat um, or I'll give them a line of dialogue and I'll be like, I don't even know if they would say that. That doesn't feel right for them. Uh, and so I think for me with side characters, it just takes me like the entire drafting process to get to a place where I know them well enough. Um, and I also like I benefit from having like some really hilarious friends. Um, and so I also just like steal little bits of their personality and put them into side characters uh, and have them then read my books and be like, oh, okay, like what if Parisa said this? Like how, let's like give her this line and be like, okay, awesome. Uh, and so I think that helps, but honestly it takes me so long to, to get to know them and to find that their voice actually is. Um, so it happens painstaking care. Well, I mean, it, it definitely works because I mean, you get to the end, you're like, I need a Jules book. I need a Parisa <laughs> book. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I'm always so impressed because usually my way of distinguishing side characters is like, one of them has short hair and one <laughs> of them has long hair. <laughs> 
Um, and so Charm came out last week, and it has been just so incredible to see the outpouring of love for it on social media. Like, this book is, I mean, for anyone who hasn't read it yet, like, it is just so special. Like, <laughs> it really just makes my heart, like, lurch in my chest every time I think about it. Um, but what has been the most exciting part of the debut experience for you so far? Absolutely, like, 10,000%. Uh, it has been hearing from people who, like, sneak into my DMs and like tell me about their experience reading the book, um, which I find funny because one, um, I have always been terrified of sharing my writing with people. And like up until pretty much this book coming out, like I never shared my writing with anyone. Uh, and then two, I always figured authors would hate that if I ever like tried to message them about my experience reading their book, but I absolutely love it. Um, it's been wonderful. And especially people who reach out to me about like the mental health representation, uh, and people who reach out to me about the asexual spectrum representation and getting to, to hear from people who say that they feel really seen by that or, or validated um, in their experiences and identity, that's just hands down the, the best part. Oh, absolutely. Like, just nothing really compares you to just how, like, leveling it, it feels to, to get a message like that. Yeah. And just to be like, wow, okay, so it was worth it. Like, this was terrifying. Like, this you know, putting it out there was really scary. Um, but even just like one message like that kind of makes it all feel pretty worth it. Yeah. And I think it's also so easy to feel like, you know, we're writing this usually in solitude and for so much of it, it just really takes place like on our computer, just like one-on-one -on -one, you in the, in the Word document. And then it, hearing from someone, it just feels like this reminder that like, oh, like it is reaching a stranger who like, didn't read the book because they they had to and they're friends with me. Um, it's just kind of this, this amazing reminder that like it is out there and people are in, interacting with it. Yeah. And it's good to remember that too, when you're like stuck writing and you're like, oh my gosh, this book is not working, you know, when you're drafting and it's so difficult and it's so isolating to be like, okay, but like if one person reads this and really needed like this scene or this, this character, then hopefully it'll be worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I also want to talk about, before we get to questions, so, and again, put in, put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, the cover of this book is just such perfection. Um, the composition, the colors are so fun, and even the expressions on their, their little faces. <laughs> I think there are a lot of covers out there right now that um, have, like, faceless, faceless characters. I know that's been kind of the trend for a while, and I just... I think that what's what makes this cover so special is that like you actually get to see their faces and I don't know they kind of captured their personalities perfectly really um, well so, yeah yeah <laughs> the, like anxious like cuff adjusting that Charlie is doing yeah like his little cheekbone is just kind of kills me um <laughs> but uh so did it just pop into your inbox like bam this perfection or what was the yep, process pretty like? much yeah really yeah, I had no idea. They asked me, they were like, okay, what are your thoughts about covers? And I was like, I don't know, I'm not an artist. Like, I know nothing. But I have no vision for the cover at all. Um, I like the illustrated covers, I think is what I said. And then I sent a picture, or I sent like a couple of covers that I really have loved um, from recent romance books. And then, yeah, I got an email with like that cover pretty much exactly as it appears there. And then like the second cover. Um, and there were like two options and I was like, that one. Uh, what yeah. was the other one? <laughs> the other one, I really liked the color. The other one was blue and it still had, I think the yellow lights. Um, and like now I really like the pink and the yellow combination better because it like straddles summer and fall so nicely. Um, but it was blue and super cute, but it had um, a female contestant in the foreground. Mm. And so I was like, mm, no, I don't think so. I like think that muddies like, what the plot is so it kind of looked less queer um and I love this cover because even though they're separate um and so it's not like overtly queer and like they're not physically touching like their eye contact is really like wonderful um and I think it still kind of reads as a as a queer romance yeah for sure no I think this this cover is so perfect yeah. um and, you know, I think everyone after reading this is probably eager to know what you are working on now and what you have coming up next. Yeah, so coming up very soon, at least on my timeline, because I have a deadline October 1st, um, my next book is going to come out with Atria again uh, in fall of 2022. So it'll be 
a year after charm and it's a uh, sapphic Christmas rom-com. So I just describe it as like a Hallmark Christmas movie, but with like ladies falling in love. Uh, and it takes place in Portland and there's, you know, snow and wintry things. And I, I love it. I'm very excited about it. Oh, I love that so much. And especially I, anything set in the Northwest is like an immediate yes <laughs> for me. I know. Well, and whenever I read your books, you have the best details that capture Seattle. And I'm always oh, like, oh, no, you. like it's so flawless. I'll never be able to capture Portland that perfectly. Um, and I like messaged you, I think, a bunch of the, the lines from Weather Girl that I was like, this is it's to Seattle. It's so perfect. I, I sometimes I think that me writing about Seattle is just me making fun of Seattle. I don't know if you had are having a similar experience with Portland. <laughs> Yeah, but it's like from a place of love. And you exactly. Can no, that's how I like, feel too. From love. I love Portland, but also hear all these hilarious things about it. For yeah. sure. And I, not that like Seattle and Portland are like uniquely suited to that, but I really think that the types of characters that, not just the ones that populate books, but in real life. <laughs> yeah, just the real life right. Characters. Yeah, yeah, just ripe for, for storytelling. Um, well, we have a lot of great questions already, so maybe we can move on to those if that sounds good. Sounds excellent, yeah. All right. Um, so someone asked an um, anonymous question. Can you talk a bit about the choice of writing in, writing in such specific hobbies to serve as bonding moments between Charlie and Dave? Are they personal favorites of yours, inspired by people in your life, or a mix of sources? Uh, definitely a mix. So if I like my hobbies, the first one that comes to my mind is like puzzling, um, which yeah, I want to be somebody who loves puzzling. And like, sometimes I can find it so calming for my brain. Um, but usually it actually, I just get more anxious. Um, there's something about it that's hard for me to focus on. Um, uh, but my sister loves to puzzle. And in fact, like, yes, I do mean, I do mean puzzling. Uh, my sister will say like that I just stole from my little sister, um, who will unironically be like, I'm going to work on a puzz. Um, or we'll be like, what are you doing? And she'll be like, I'm puzzing right now. Um, and it's just like so ridiculous. And so I was like, Ooh, I'm going to like make him say that. Um, and yeah, it became a whole thing. Um, but yes, so that one is, is my sister and like, but the love of like science fiction television, um, that one's me. Um, uh, and I... I love The Expanse. That is a wonderful show. Um, and so, yeah, definitely a mix of, of the two. Um, this actually leads perfectly into this next question, um, which is, um, as someone who identifies strongly with Charlie and his interests, what shows other than The Expanse should we consume while puzzing that Charlie <laughs> would also love? <laughs> Um, well, Charlie would definitely love Battlestar Galactica. And really, that's my, like, my OG science fiction love. I adore that show, and, like, consumed it really intensely in college. Um, but I felt like it wasn't as current, so I changed it to the expanse that, that they watched together, because that was a more modern example. Um, but if you have not seen Battlestar Galactica, I, I highly recommend it. Um, I also, and this is, like, maybe an embarrassing show. I don't know. I loved it. Um, I don't even know. Is it like TNT, TBS? One of them um, has a show called 12 Monkeys, like based on the, the old movie, right? Is it 12 Monkeys? Um, and it is just delightful science fiction fun. The science makes no sense about that one, um, <laughs> but I still adore it, so... Um, nice. Those, those seem like spot on wrecks. Um, let's see. So um, this one is one that I know you've answered on Instagram um, and, and really thoughtfully. And um, it is, um, I, I think, a question that is brought up a lot in both like the queer romance um, space and just in like queer literature spaces more broadly. Um, but this one is, did you have any reservations writing a, um, an MM romance as someone who identifies as a woman? I love that there's more queer representation and I'm curious why you chose Charlie and Div to represent this story. Yeah. Um, and so did I have reservations in terms of writing it? No, because when I first wrote it, I was just writing it for myself. Um, and so, you know, I did not ever expect that this would be a book that I published. And so when I was writing the story, it was really like my own processing. And so I didn't have reservations in that sense. 
but I did once I was like, okay, well, I actually really love this story. I think like it has potential to, to be a thing that I would be comfortable sharing with the world. Um, and once I got to that point, I, I did have a, a lot more reservations. Um, I mean, I think mostly about, you know, not doing harm, like as a cis woman writing about cis men. But the reason that I wrote a story about two men as opposed to two women um, is because at the time that I, I wrote this, like I was still like very closeted um, and like not just like my family and friends, like no one knew uh, that I was queer, but also like I was not fully in a place where I was um, like self-accepting. And so the idea of writing about two women was a lot for me at, at that exact moment in time. Um, and so I had decided once I, I came up with the idea to write about a reality dating show, I was like, well, I want to write about queerness within that heteronormative paradigm, right? Especially like as a critique of kind of the single narrative we see about who gets a love story, um, you know, in all forms of media, but especially in reality television. Um, and so making that decision, I kind of knew that it was going to be two men instead of two women because I wasn't quite there. And of course, like then writing this book is what enabled me to come out, um, you know, as gay and like that has been a really great process for me. Um, but I know that writing from someone else's perspective is always, you know, really risky and making sure um, you know, not to do harm. Yeah. And, and thank you so much for sharing all of that. I mean, on, on Instagram and, and here too, like that's again, like but what we were saying earlier, just about this book being so personal, like it's, I don't know, it just feels like a huge privilege to get you here, to hear you talk about this. So thank you very much. Oh yeah, thank you. And of course, like writing this also, like I wrote this book and then you know, the, the series that no one will ever read, like the next book was, uh, you know, a sapphic um, FF love story. Um, and so like, I think writing this book kind of helped me get to a place where I could tell love stories about women. Um, and so of course, I'm really excited that my next book um, is a love story between two women that I'm in a place again, after a lot of therapy, uh, where I'm ready to, to tell that story, and I feel really good about it. That's awesome, and I am positive that that people will be following you to that book and, and beyond. <laughs> um, let's see what else there are, and, and again, if there are more questions that come up, feel free to pop them in the Q&A box. Um, this is a fun one, just on the complete <laughs> other end of the spectrum. Um, what is your go-to snack or drink when you are writing? Um, I mean, I don't tend to snack very much while writing. I eat my meals while writing, which is like not good. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. But I usually like eat in front of my computer, um, my like breakfast and lunch. Uh, and then for drinks, I drink coffee until I can't drink coffee anymore. And then I switch to my, my water bottle. Um, and then I like to treat myself to sour punch bites. Um, that is my go-to like post-writing snack is sour punch bites. They are just delicious, pure, pure sugar nuggets. And I adore them. Um, yeah, I like to keep myself from eating too much like sweets. I keep just like a bag of chocolate raisins, mm -hmm. um, which <laughs> sounds so like, who chocolate raisins, like really... I mean, honestly, that sounds delicious. I would eat some chocolate raisins right now. Um, yeah, and so I'll, I will usually just have, like, a couple of them in between, like, writing breaks. Like, I usually try to go for, you know, half an hour and then take a little break, get a chocolate raisin. Um, but, uh, yeah, something sour is good, too. Um, I really love this question. So for both Allison and Rachel, can you pinpoint which romance book hooked you into the genre and sparked your love of romance novels? Um, I love that question. So I feel like it's, it's tricky because there's like the part of me that always loved romance and like read nothing, but like, you know, that had to have a love story in it. Everything that I've ever read, um, I've always really enjoyed that aspect of the media that I consume, um, like big fan of romantic comedy movies. But I think in terms of kind of the recent romance novels that really were, um, influential for me would be The Kiss Quotient by Helen Wong, because um, that book was one of the first books I read where I was like, oh, like, look at this neurodivergent character. Like, uh, look at this romance. Like, I didn't know that those kind of characters could be featured in romance. Um, and I think that one really kind of 
got me super excited about romance again and kind of the ways in which, you know, I had assumed, of course, characters in romance, as much as I loved them, didn't look like me, didn't, you know, think like me, um, didn't love like me. And so uh, I think that one has been pretty influential. I had a really similar journey because I read a lot of um, like Meg Cabot and Sophie Kinsella yes. growing up. Um, mm. Yeah. And like Meg Cabot, I mean, I just wanted to be her because she wrote everything. Oh my gosh. She was amazing. I mean, she's still amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And she, I mean, she's still writing romance, but um, yeah, she, I mean, obviously her, you know, I mean, Princess Diaries was, was my favorite thing, but her adult books too were so fun. Um, and then um, like everything Sophie Kinsella. But once I got to high school, I just kind of wanted to distance myself from romance as much as possible because it felt like, oh, that's not real literature. Um, and I really did not find it again until after college. And honestly, even after, um, I would say even after I started publishing my YA, um, because I was reading a lot of YA, but not, you know, um, it, like adult romance, not like category romance. Um, so I had something similar where like the books that got me back into it were, um, I mean, The Hating Game was a huge one. Like when that came yes. out, it just kind of changed everything. I mean, it changed, I think, the genre in a really huge way. And then the, the Kiss Quotient. And then I went and back and read like every single one of Christina Lauren's books in order, um, like starting at the very beginning um, on audio and like being terrified of being in the grocery store and like my phone accidentally playing in the middle <laughs> of a sex scene. <laughs> which is a great experience. H highly recommend um, having a like a romance audiobook just going in the background accidentally. Um, so so yeah, definitely kind of twofold. Side note, Meg Cabot wrote a book. I think under, she had like a pen name, right? It was like Megan Cabot when she wrote Romance. Back she in had the a day. few pen names, but yeah, that was one of them. Yeah. And I remember the first book I ever read with a sex scene was a book by her because I love the Princess Diaries and like all of her YA. And so I found her adult romance. And I remember being like, oh my gosh, you're allowed to do this. And I think it was called She Went All the Way. Um, and it involved like Alaska maybe and like helicopters. I don't know. It was wonderful. Um, and I read it at like 16. I was like, that was the first time I had ever seen a sex scene in a book. And I felt well, so even scandalous. <laughs> even her YA, I think, like, really pushed the envelope um, with sexual content and just, like, characters talking about sex at the time, yeah. and I think that was why I found it so refreshing, because I think a lot of what, like, other YA that I was reading at the time felt very, um, I don't, I don't know why puritanical was, like, the first word that sprang to mind, but, like, yeah, it just felt like there was just a lot of stuff that was not there that I had questions about. Yeah. I love third place books ability to find she went all the way so incredibly quickly and to throw that into the chat like A plus. That's amazing. Um, I think my favorite was the uh, was it the boy next door? I think it's it's yes, called all through emails. It. I reread it a few years ago and it's still so funny. It was amazing. I just couldn't believe how well she told that book, like through that format. Um that one is also somewhere on my shelf behind me still. So good. Um, this is, this is an interesting one. Um, how did you enjoy the process of self-marketing as a debut author? Was it fun, overwhelming, both? It has been both at various times. So it was really, really difficult for me, um, when I first started. I had never had social media. Like, I have a Facebook, but only because, like, Facebook was literally invented the year I started college. So, like, everybody has a Facebook if you were my, you know, in my exact generation. Um, but I never had social media otherwise, partially because I'm a teacher. And so it just like seemed like a good idea not to have a social media presence. And partly because that's, I'm just super introverted. Um, and I'm a really private person, like <laughs> contrary to the way that I talk about some things now, like it's, I don't like sharing things about myself. And so when I first had to get on social media, um, I would like cry every time I had to post. Like the first couple times I had to post on Instagram, I would like, it was so difficult for me. Um, and so it was like, I can't do that. My sister had to be there and like help me proofread everything. She had to like, let me like, it's going to be okay. And I'd be like, it, it made me so anxious. Um, 
but I knew that like, if I just kept doing it, it would get easier and it did. Yeah. And so I think, um, it's been a lot easier. And I, for me also with self-marketing, it's been about figuring out what I I'm okay with and what I'm not okay with. Um, Instagram, I like Instagram. It's like, it makes sense for my brain. Um, it feels comfortable for me. Twitter whew, scares me, but I can like have a Twitter and just like only use it for retweets and, and responding. And then like TikTok is like a no-go for me. That one is just, it's too much. Um, it's too much putting yourself out there in the world. So. Oh yeah. No, I'm, I'm totally with you. Like there is no way I could film a video that would, you know, <laughs> that I would be happy with than not take like five hours. No, it takes, that was how, yeah. My, and my, my team has been so kind. They weren't, they didn't force me on TikTok. They were like, give it a try, see if you like it. And I tried it and it took so much time. And then like, I made a video and too many people watched it. I had like a three day panic attack because I was like, uh, that's, that's so many people, you know, and like just, so I, a lot of it has been figuring out what works best for my mental health and uh, TikTok ain't it. It's too much. Um, and I'm always yeah. so impressed by authors who can do it and who can like make reels all the time. And I'm like, yeah, that's amazing. Not for me. Yeah. It's one of those things that I'm like, if you love it and you're good at it or, and if you're a reader and you're good at it too, like by all means, yeah. um, I'm more than happy to leave it to them. Yeah. I think it's uh, with self-marketing, like whatever brings you joy, like whatever for feels sure. right for you. Um, and then being okay to say no to things that just are not a good fit. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. How about, what are some of your favorite releases so far this year? Oh my gosh, that is a tough question. Well, the Love Hypothesis comes out today, right? Yes, uh, that one's really fun. I feel like I read that so long ago, but that was early in the year, one of the first like romances where I read it like almost in a single sitting. I, I really enjoyed that one. Um, and then in terms of the other books that are already out, like obviously I loved People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry so much. I adore her dialogue. It's just incredible. Um, and then a lot of the other books that I've really loved this year, like actually come out next year, because um, that is the <laughs> I know, difficult <laughs> thing about being a writer is um, like obviously Weather Girl is one of my... Oh, thank you. No, I mean, I just love, I love that book. Um, I'm so excited for it. And then um, Timothy Janowski's Never Been Kissed, which is also a queer rom-com, comes out in May of next year. So it still feels like a really long time away, but um, that's just absolutely one of my favorite books um, that I've read this oh, year. I have that on my Kindle and I'm so excited to read it. Oh yeah. It's, I, I just adore it. It's, um, it's wonderful. It also has like asexual spectrum representation. And so um, that one means a lot to me. Um, and then I'm reading Love and Other Disasters uh, still by Anita Kelly. And it's so good. And it's only taking me forever because um, it turns out it is really hard to do publicity and read a book at the same time. <laughs> um, but yes, so many good books that are coming out. Um, but yeah, so many of them feel far away. Yeah, I guess a couple others to recommend from this year. I know it's like so impossible to <laughs> to think about this past year. Um, but uh, The Shoddy Setup by Lily Vale yes, came out read that last yet. week. Um, and that one's a lot of fun. Um, and then another one that I keep thinking about is Twice Shy by Sarah Hogel. Um, if anyone's read um, You Deserve Each Other, which was her debut, which is fantastic. Um, she just has this voice that is like unlike anyone else's. And this Twice Shy is um, so, so phenomenal. Okay, I haven't read that one yet, but that sounds wonderful. Oh, you've got to, it's, it's great. Um, this is fun. Uh, if you had to recommend a meal, a food or a meal to represent the charm offensive, what would it be? <laughs> um, a food, like any food, it would be like probably uh, mint Oreos. That's what I most associate as like a junk food that appears in the book. Um, yeah, I guess a meal that represents it. I was about to say chicken wings because like in a very old draft um in a another deleted scene uh there's a scene with like chicken wings and like chicken wings get all over dude's face and, like it's a whole thing <laughs> um and then I was like wait that scene does not exist that's that's not a scene that I ended up keeping in the book um so yeah probably mentorios um uh, I think that's it 
think we probably talked maybe a little bit about this, but um, I'm sure there's there's more that can be discussed. Um, who's your biggest writing inspiration? That is a great question. Because I feel like so many people, um, there are so many writers that I really look up to in, in different ways in terms of, of what, um, especially within the romance genre. So like thinking about Christina Warren, um, who you mentioned earlier, like as, you know, obviously a duo, but that is so prolific and so consistent in the books that they, that they put out um, and that they're always so, their books are so wonderful. And they're also just very wonderful members of the, the romance community. Yes. And they do a lot to support new writers. And I think that that is something um, that's really admirable. And so that's something that inspires me. I feel like the same is true about you, Rachel, um, that you're someone who really like, Thank you. I mean, yeah, is kind to, to new writers who know no one and have no idea what they're doing. And um, I think that's something that there are a lot of writers I look up to for their writing, but also a lot of writers I look up to for kind of how they engage with the community. Yeah, Christina Lauren is definitely one that comes up a lot for me too because they are just so generous with their time and so so supportive like when you get to a certain stage like you could probably just disappear off social media just write your books it, from a little cabin somewhere and they'd still do well I mean I think like Suzanne Collins famously doesn't have a website mm -hmm. or, or something like that um and yet they like take the time to engage and and support and it's just so amazing. Like, it just really makes you feel like um, the, the romance community just feels like the warmest hug, honestly. And coming from the YA community, which um, is, is also really wonderful, but can sometimes feel a little bit like high school <laughs> <laughs> in the shockingly, um, j just in terms of um, I, I don't know. I think it's it, it, it's been really interesting seeing the, the differences in those communities, but the romance community is just like tremendously inclusive, tremendously supportive, and just feels like they kind of welcome you right away. Yeah, everyone has been so kind. And yeah, I feel very lucky to have the opportunity to connect with other romance writers. And I think too, to go back to like social media, that that's part of it too. Like you, that's how you connect with other writers because we're all so isolated and we're all over the place. Um, having that connection to other writers is really uh, important and valuable. Um, we probably have time for a couple more questions and I am very curious to hear this answer. Um, I know Rachel writes both YA and adult, but would Allison ever dip into YA? Um, <laughs> Would you? I saw earlier that my like agent is here and she's like, answer this carefully, I'm sure. Um, I would. <laughs> hey, like, I don't know. I had a YA book idea that I was like really obsessed with for a good like month. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I really wanted to write it and like I got it out of my system. Like I outlined it, I did the whole thing, and I was like, okay, now this can like go and exist in a draft. Um, yeah, I think I like the idea of writing YA, but I also you know, there, there are so many queer stories in the YA literature world. Um, and I am so grateful because like, for me, YA, like um, queer YA was the first time I ever saw queer characters represented um, in books that I was reading. And so there are so many books um, that have come out in the last, you know, 10 years, but especially in like the last five years that have been so influential on me um, in helping me understand my queer identity. But I think, one of the things I like is in mainstream romance, like we don't have a ton of queer stories. And so I, and every time I have, a, like I get a queer story in romance, I'm always like beside myself. I'm so happy. And like, um, and I even remember like two years ago, I was like, we have another one. There's another one coming out, you know? And so um, I do really like being able to write queer love stories for adults, um, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, I love young adult and I would love to write a young adult book someday, but I think it's really important for adults to also get to see themselves reflected in queer stories. Um, and especially queer stories that are just like about queer joy. Um, you know, there's obviously so much literature out there um, that deals with various facets of the queer experience, but um, I think having queer romance is important too. Uh, you know, as much as I and and your agent, I think would <laughs> would would want away from you. I I think that's 
that's really great. And that makes a ton of sense. And, and you're so right that it is something that is, it, there are so many, it seems like there are so many more queer books in YA than romance. Um, and fortunately that's changing. Like I yeah. remember when, like you were saying, it was like, oh, there was one this year in mainstream traditional pub, traditionally pubbed romance. Um, and, you know, hopefully very soon that will be in the double digits. Yeah. And, and I think it, it is. There's so it, many. Actually, I'm sure it already is. Yeah. yeah. And I think too, like there's so many, uh, you know, indie publishers have been specializing in like LGBTQ yeah. stories for a really long time. But for me, as someone who didn't know where to find them, like I had no idea those existed. Um, and so I think having those, those mainstream, um, easy to access, you know, on a table in Barnes and Noble yes. books is also really valuable. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I know it's it's so easy to to have that conversation and make it seem like those books are not coming out at all. But um, yes, like indie publishers and or small publishers and people yeah. self publishing have, have obviously been doing it for for years and years, and and it definitely like paving the way. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. I don't know if anyone has like one last question because I think that's. Anyone wants to get one in there really quickly? Um, <laughs> and now I'm trying to think of a question. Is there anything you haven't been asked yet that you're like, please ask me about? I, no, not really. Um, one fast story I will tell uh, because one detail, so like I put a lot of travel details into the book and one thing no one ever asks about because why would they? Um, but in the book, like when they go to to Bali, so they're in uh, they're in Bali in the town like Ami, which is where I went when I stayed there, and like they hear the song "Shallow" by uh, Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper, and uh, like they're super excited because it's like a Lady Gaga like motif. Um, but in real life, like when I went to Bali, like "Shallow" is the only song that played the entire time I was there everybody was obsessed with it. Like you would go out to dinner every night and there was like a band that would play shallow. Um, and like, it was on the radio, like every 10 minutes, like they were so in love with that book or with that song. And, uh, like I worked so hard to try to get that detail in there because in August of 2019, that was the only song that was playing on the entire Island of Bali. Oh my God. That is so funny. It, you know, it's funny how sometimes like it takes a while for big songs to reach certain certain places or like certain places really like latch onto a song. Like I've been in Amsterdam for um, almost five months and the number of times I have heard Despacito playing in a grocery store or from like a food truck is like at least four, which Love is that. a lot. Love that for Amsterdam. <laughs> um, I've also heard the Macarena twice. Oh. Nice. Yeah, so they're still loving the Macarena over here. Yeah. And here's, I think this is actually a fun one to wrap up on. Um, what is your favorite book that most people haven't heard of? Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, no, is, is it like, going to be impossible? Yeah, like I am, I feel like also I'm just like such a basic reader. Um, I read a lot of books that I feel like a lot of people really love. Um, sorry. No, we should have to... ended on Shallow. I know, on my like Shallow <laughs> anecdote that nobody needed to hear. Um Honestly, okay, well, so somebody mentioned, I think it was actually Danielle who works for Third Place Books when we were talking about Meg Cabot, her like paranormal series. And she had a paranormal series like way back in the day called like The Mediator. I can't remember if she wrote it. Yes, real name. so good. Yeah, and like, uh, I don't know, that made me think of it. That series, I don't know if that series is like, no one's ever heard of it, it's just old. But I adored that series as a teenager. Um, like. Teenage Allison, all-time favorite. Yes, the Mediator series was so good. Maybe she wrote it. Did she write it under a pen name, Danielle? I think she did, and they reissued it. And then they reissued it name. under her name. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think she wrote it under, it was, it was like Jenny something, I want to say. Yeah. I can't remember. Because she did, and then she had her, like, historical romance that were also under a different name. So it was hard. I read all of them. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, but no, I, I loved those so, so much. Um, I'll... Great. Well, I think we're we're at the end. If we want to pass it back to third place, and thank you so much for the thank the you so, fast, so much the fast typing and the the lightning <laughs> quick <sighs> recommendations. Oh yeah, you guys killed that. There are so many. <laughs> well, well done. Those questions can be so tricky on the spot. You know, you really brought you brought it. So, <laughs> hello everyone. I'm back. 
Thank you so much for being here. Um, audience members, you have been such a delight. I so appreciate all of your great questions and comments. This was so much fun. Authors, this was such a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for sharing of this, this whole process. I, I was very engaged <laughs> in the story of how this book uh, came to be. Um, this has been such a pleasure as always. So audience members, because I have linked so many books in <laughs> chat, I'm going to just go ahead and relink the uh, the big two. The Charm Offensive is that top one. Um, to pre-order Weather Girl, it comes out in January. Go ahead and follow those it. links. Yeah, and they're so, so great. <laughs> um, and I think at this point, I'm just going to say one more huge, huge thank you to everyone. And it is time for some awkward waving. <laughs> this part. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much, <laughs> thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. <laughs>